Good afternoon, 49er faithful. Welcome to another episode of the Hammerhead Show. As always, I'm your host, Rob Shue, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jack Hammer of the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. Jack, are you excited that this is the last dead Friday before week one? I am. I'm looking forward to it, Look forward to it quite a bit. Next Friday, I'll be getting ready to head out to Chicago. See you out in Chicago for the week one, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I can't get this thing roll. Wait to get this thing rolling. Absolutely. Next Friday, we're going to be knee deep in that game prep mode. And then, yes, next day, I'm off to Chicago. We will definitely be seeing one another for that opener for the season. And today, we're kicking off the three day weekend. We got some good topics. So let's get into it. We've got the usual cohort of uh, enthusiastic individuals in the chat Stephen McGinnis, Raphael 562 Niners, Russell Peterson, The Gabe Niners Show, John Gabriel, Kevin is coming in, Shib Tiger, Jamie Bryant, and the notorious GAV with his prediction. Ga- Captain Juice incoming. <laughs> Gav is relentless on it. I, Gav, I saw someone put up a prank of uh, team captains. It was to highlight Jimmy Garoppolo as a team captain. And at first glance, I didn't see Jimmy, but I was looking specifically for Juice, didn't see him. And I thought, oh, no, Gav's going to be heartbroken. Thankfully, that was indeed just a false image. And uh, I think Juice is going to make it. I think Juice is going to be one of those captains. Do you get that sense, Jack? He, he should be. I, I really I think he should be. I think he he embodies everything that the four years are about. I, I think he definitely should be one. I'm glad to see, as as Gav points out here, I was not the only one that fell for that <laughs> fake news. Appreciate all of you that are here in the chat. Smash that like button. As always, help Jack and I amplify the signal, getting it out to more and more faithful as we creep towards week one. So we're going to start this thing off talking about the the 53 man roster. Uh, Jack, you obviously attended the vast majority of practices going back through OTAs. You know, you've given us amazing observations, your unfiltered opinions throughout. Uh, You know that we had to ask you for your take on the the final roster that we have come down to and how that sets the team up headed into week one. Did the correct bodies end up on this roster, in your opinion, Jack? Yeah, I can't think of one that I would say doesn't belong on the 53. Uh, the way that the way that it played out, you know, the only the only real surprise for me was Kamoka Ture not making it. Right. Uh, I think that was really the only one for me. Um, but beyond that, I, I felt like they they did a really good job. Um, you know, Nick Zackle, Zakel, excuse me, making it was a little bit of a surprise, but not totally in that he was a draft pick and uh, he really came on as training camp went through. Uh, he definitely showed a lot of improvement and uh, I, I don't think there was, you know, I know a lot of people were wanting guys like Jason Poe and, and some of yes. these other guys to make it. I never really felt like he was going to make it. So it wasn't a big surprise for me to see some of those guys that didn't make it too. For a guy like Jason Poe, not making it obviously a fan favorite, obviously someone that many people, including myself predicted would make it through to the 53 man roster because of the fact that that hype was there. Everyone was talking about him playing him up at, at what was observed during practices. Does it factor in? Do the 49ers do an equation here wherein they calculate not only who's the best individual to make the 53-man roster, but which individual is more likely to clear waivers and thus be able to stash two players, one on the 53-man roster and another potentially on that practice squad? Do you think that became a calculation in determining whether it was Zakel or Jason Poe who was kept on the original 53? I'm not sure about like with Zakel and, and Poe, but it definitely is something that, that plays a factor in it. I think that's why you have, you know, Jim, the way they kind of went with Jimmy Ward and with, um, not a minute, let me not, maybe not Jimmy Ward, but more like Trey Sermon, right? You keep Trey Sermon on your 53 man roster because you don't want him to get picked up right away. And so I think, you know, they wanted to play that up as far as they could go. They probably would have, he'd probably still be on the roster if the offensive lineman, uh, if Hans hadn't become available, he'd probably still be there. It was, they, you know, they were trying to trade, get a trade for him, and and, and Philadelphia played it smart, and um, you know he ended up in, in Philly, and you know, but there's definitely some of that. There's definitely gamesmanship on that. There, there, there had to have been a reason why they had Curtis Robinson um, on their 53 man roster, and we're going to get into it a little bit later as far as the practice squad piece too, and why they kept, you know, only three safeties and things like that. 
Yeah, the Curtis Robinson one was an intriguing uh, move for me in that I had talked to you about the possibility of trying to sneak him through onto IR, but I thought they would do that prior to the waiver system. My guess is if they didn't have that handshake agreement in place with with Jordan Willis and Tyler Croft, that they probably wouldn't have made that move. But who's to say they may have valued that depth with both Aziz Alshire and Dre Greenlaw headed towards unrestricted free agency. Wanted to bring in one of the uh, questions here in the chat, as well as a compliment. Can't do dairy coming in to say real hot voice. I appreciate compliments anytime they come in. Wanted to make sure to get that out there. Moses Martinez, though, is disputing you here, Jack. He says, Rob Shue, the surprise to me was Ambry Thomas. He's horrible, and I don't care what Jack Hammer says. I, I, just, don't, I, I love the end of that. I, Absolutely. I no faith in Jack here, Moses. No, I know Moses trusts your eye, Jack, but he's in direct conflict here. What say you, Jack? No, I don't know why he's saying he doesn't care what I say. I, I've been, I've been ripping Ambry Thomas since, since you have throughout, throughout training camp. So I, I haven't really said anything positive about Ambry Thomas since training camp started. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think what I said was, you know, at one point during camp, if the 49ers quarterbacks are struggling or receivers struggling, you uh, put that receiver on Ambry Thomas and you have that quarterback throw at Ambry Thomas. Uh, but that's just kind of the way that that training camp played out for the guy. Uh, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure where Moses go, is going here. That is really, really rough. Okay, so it, it sounded as if there weren't any big misses for you. Uh, to me, the only one was Tariq Castro-Fields not making the team. Felt like we were a little thin at secondary. In thinking of that, of, of Tariq Castro-Fields not making it, of the Niners being at least temporarily down to three safeties on the roster, do you feel the same way as John B does here? John B sneakerhead here on the channel saying, I feel like he's on the roster cut. Oh, no. Uh, yes, yes. We're talking about the roster cut if they bring in Tart or another safety. The question there being, do you believe the 49ers will explore the option of bringing in Tart or promoting Gibson or bringing in another safety now that Jimmy Ward's on IR? Yeah, there's somebody that he's talking about who he thinks is going to be gone if they do bring in, in Tart. I'm not sure who that is, but I don't. I don't think Jaworski Tart is going to be coming to the 49ers. I don't think he wants to be with the 49ers. I think is is the biggest thing. I don't right. have a I don't have a I don't have a source to tell me why, uh, but just from what I've heard, um, kind of around the people, is that Tart isn't happy with the 49ers and the 40 and, and I think I think there might be a little bit of mutualness between the two of them. Right. Um, so I, that's why we'll see. I mean, I'm like I wouldn't be. I'm not against Jaworski Tart playing for the 49ers. If they could bring him and he wants to be here, then you go out and get it done. Very nice. Uh, John B. Clarifying, it was Curtis Robinson he was speaking about there uh, in regard to who might be cut. Another question coming in from the audience, E. Kim here. Rob, I don't understand why this front office selects running backs before the fifth round, and I see TDP going the sermon route. So two questions for you in here, Jack. Your opinion on it, I'll give mine as well. Whether you believe... There is a chance TDP is headed down the same route as Trey Sermon. And do you agree with this? Do you think it is foolhardy for the 49ers to continue investing these early round draft picks when they seemingly haven't worked out to this point? You know, I'm not sure what, what's happened in there, but I, I will say this. I do agree with uh, with Ekim on the TDP thing. Mm. I, I see TDP, uh, Ty Davis Price and Trey Sermon are, are kind of one and the same to me. Right. In a lot of ways, if you go back and watch their college film, they're both guys that are, you know, volume backs that don't put up, didn't put up big numbers um, unless they carried the ball a lot. And and their best games came when they, you know, it wasn't like they were ripping off 100 yard games um, left and right. They were guys that had a few good games over the course of their career. And that's what everybody points to. But I don't know. I haven't been impressed with her, uh, with Ty Davis Price throughout it. Um, as far as, you know, selecting running backs before the fifth round. Like John Lynch said yesterday, they, that's something that they need to address within their their process. Yeah, um, you know, taking a guy in the third round isn't a bad deal, but you, you got to get you got to hit on those. But here's the other thing too, real quick. I know people are, are going to complain about the the Trey Sermon thing and the 49ers having to cut him after a third round pick. Go look at how many of the 2021 third round draft picks the Minnesota Vikings had that they cut this week. It's Yeesh. like three three out of the four that they had last year because they had a, a boatload of, thir of third round picks last season and they cut, I think all of them, but maybe one. 
Yeah, I, in going back to, to Ekim's original two questions here, to your point about TDP, I don't have enough information there to, to make a determination on my part. I'm going to be looking for the regular season to be able to, to see whether TDP can separate himself from what Sermon was able to do last season. It won't take much for him to show more than Sermon did in his first year with the San Francisco 49ers. And with regard to the other I agree with with Jack in what he's saying there, that the organization very clearly needs to go back and talk about what it is they're looking for, how they're going about selecting those individuals. But I see nothing wrong with selecting a player, a running back, specifically that early in the draft, as long as you do hit on that. Because I know Kyle Shanahan is saying to himself, like, you guys are giving me all this shit because I hit on these six rounders and these undrafted free agents. But you just wait until I hit on one of these second rounders and an undrafted free agent. It's going to go off, right? Every <laughs> draft pick, to your point, Jack, of saying how many Minnesota missed on and, and cut from the third round last year as well, every draft pick is a risk when it comes to selecting. They all have a chance of missing. And that leads into the next question, the next point here, which is, Jack, are you impressed with the fact that from the last two draft classes, all but two are still on this absolutely stacked roster? You have Cast Tariq Castro-Fields not, uh, not being selected for the 53-man roster, but being claimed by a team that did put him onto the 53-man roster this year. And then Trey Sermon, the only one from the 2021 draft class that is no longer with the team. And again, got claimed by another team within the league. So everyone from the 49ers past two draft classes is on a 53 man roster right now. Yeah. So, well, and, and also think of it this way. You, you, you screwed up the pick for, for Trey Sermon, right? You also added a player this year in Jordan Mason so you, you screwed up your draft pick, but you found another young guy anyway. So whether it's right. a third round pick or an undrafted free agent, you know, and I think if you go back and I don't have it in front of me right now, but if you, is there an undrafted free agent that the 49ers signed last year that was an undrafted free agent rookie that's still on the roster? If so, the, what you just said right there is every draft pick that they had, there is a young player that's still on the roster that's accounting for it. I don't really, at, at this point, I don't care where a player got drafted. That only matters on draft day. Once they get to to the season, I don't Great care. Point. And and that that de determination to cut Trey Sermon should be applauded for just that. John Lynch did talk about it, and don't get me wrong, he is selling that narrative because it spins a negative into a positive, right? It is, hey, I'm mm -hmm. cutting a third round draft pick, but uh, listen mm -hmm. to me, I'm cutting a third round draft pick. I'm I'm admitting, Mia culpa, I made the mistake, right? We're moving on. We're not wasting the roster spot. And while that is the company line, that is him actively selling a mistake, it's also the correct way to look at it. We should be thrilled that they were willing to admit they got it wrong. We should be thrilled that they parted ways with Trey Sermon and went with the more talented undrafted free agent this year. Isn't that true? Yeah, you'd rather have them, like, like, like John Lynch said, you'd rather have them keeping the best players on the roster than keeping somebody around that isn't good enough to make the play. Right. That's not how you build a championship roster is just keeping a guy around just because you, you don't want to show that you're wrong. I think that's something that's been said a lot of about this group that people are holding on to for some reason. And uh, it's not true. Like that's not that they're, true. That they're beholden, you know, they're beholden to their draft picks. They are. It's a trade. It's a John Lynch guy. It's a Kyle Shanahan guy. They're they're not going to get rid of them. They they don't want to show that they don't want to you know admit that they're wrong. Right. And, and those that they gave a little bit longer leash to, it was because they did flash something at some point. Witherspoon, Dante Pettis, right? They had ascending moments that would cause you to believe they should stick around and therefore were given a little bit of a, a longer leash to get there. Got a couple of great comments to uh, bring in here. Melvin Crediford with the Creative uh, Winner Award here. Hammer and shoe attorneys at law will hammer the opposition so badly that you'll walk out of court wearing your opponent's shoes. Jack, this might be our new motto for the show here. And and can't do dairy. I just got to say thank you, Rob. I just wanted to say you're cute. Keep up the good work. Again, compliments are always going to make it on screen here. But David, sir, brings in the question here. He says, Rob, if you see any positions being addressed mid-season, what would it be? This is one that we were going to, to hit later in, in talking about preparing for Chicago. And we still will talk about it as it relates to week one. But it comes back to our summation of the 53-man roster. 
What position groups, Jack, do you see as the weakest at this point in time? Where might the 49ers potentially add some depth midseason? Uh, depth midseason. Keep keep an eye on on the offensive line. I think that's one that where you just need to keep keep an eye on there because they have a lot of young guys. I, I think out of their out of I think they have four or five guys that are in either year one or two on that offensive line and. Uh, especially right tackles a little unsettled right now with McGlinchey being bent, you know, he's still coming back and, you know, behind uh, Colt McKivitz is your best tackle behind him. Uh, so that might be something that, that you need to worry about there. And then also keep an eye out on the cornerback spot. I, I know mm. that they, they have some depth there and, you know, Jason Brett is expected to be back at some point, but I think they need to add some depth there as well. And possibly. Yes. Th- uh, this podcaster is heavily rooting for Jason Verrett's return. As some of the viewers may remember, I invested in some of his game-worn cleats, and uh, he needs to play for the 49ers yet again after I've purchased those so that I can feel better about that unreasonable purchase there, Jack. Uh, it looks like E. Kim is agreeing with you on O-line, and I think that is a common concern for a lot of, of 49er faithful in thinking about the O-line and the depth that is there. Talking about the the continued depth of this team and really looking at this idea that practice squads seem to be becoming an extension of the roster, were you pleased with the practice squad depth that the 49ers have been able to put together to this point with still, I believe, a couple of of spots available? Yeah, they still have a couple of spots available. This is, again, they they went out and, you know, 50 uh, on their roster, they have 50 a 53 man roster. Plus I think they have 14 right now in the practice squad that whole, all those guys were on their 80 man roster just a week ago, except for one of them. uh, The Hans Blake Hans is the only one that was right. So they went from 80 to what's 52 plus 14, 66. So they only lost 14 of their players um, when they did cuts. Everybody else is still on this team. And that's, that speaks volumes for, again, for the, the, um, player, to, you know, the player acquisition group, the, you know, the front office and the, the player personnel department. That's what I was trying to say. And really, as far as I could think, the only misses that could have filled out that practice squad might have been Jamichael Hasty, Trey Sermon and Tariq Castro Fields. And the reason they're not on the practice squad is because they were literally claimed and will be on 53 man rosters or at least are on an initial 53-man roster right now. So it's not as if those players chose to go elsewhere, chose to be on another team's practice squad. They were swooped up by other squads. Yeah, they they got got picked up in other places. You know, I got one guy that's that's not here that I would be interested to see if maybe they bring back is Josh Hokett, the the fullback, because he can do multiple things for you. Um, And and he's a good practice squad player, but he might be at that point in his career where he doesn't want to deal with that anymore. And he just wants to see if, you know, if he's either going to be on a roster. I don't know. And and did he end up joining, was it Arizona's practice squad at the moment? I don't know if he's on the practice squad. I know that he, he signed with Arizona. I know they released him. I don't know if he signed back to the practice. Ah, was released after that point. Fair enough. Fair enough. I I will bring in Harold's comment here after I put in the notorious GAV doing the good work there. Sneakerhead here on the channel says juice up that like button faithful (laughs) Harold Murillo though, coming in to say rich Eisen predicted the 49ers at four and four by the bye. My prediction is six and two by the bye, Rob and Jack. I just have to call out that this is what I've predicted the 49ers to be at. When I landed at my 11 wins for the season, I predicted four and four at the bye. And I do think given the way in which things have played out right now, given the presence of Jimmy Garoppolo on this roster, if it is at four and four, that could be a very problematic atmosphere for this team. A lot of outside pressure might be applied to this organization if they find themselves at four and four. Jack, I know that you're not believing the 49ers will be at four and four or were not when we did our original way too early schedule predictions. Mm-hmm. If we are, though, if hypothetically we are sitting at four and four, what type of, of drama would you imagine at that point? There's going to be a ton of dra- drama from the fan base, right? Because that it, that's just the way that it is. Um, I don't think the drama is going to be in the, in the, in the building and the, the foreigners building, the but important part. you have that, you'll have that drama in the, in the media and in, and, you know, cause we're going to be asking those questions and no matter what, and uh, cause you have to, and, and, you know, the fan base is going to be, look, 
you're old enough, Rob, to remember when uh, when the 49ers fans were, were chanting for Derek Carr. It doesn't matter who. Yes, I, I do. Yes, <laughs> I do. Poor Alex. <laughs> so, you know, they, it doesn't matter who the starting quarterback is. It doesn't matter who the backup quarterback is. Fans, if the team's losing and the quarterback isn't playing at a high level or they feel like quarterback's going to get to blame even if he is playing to what the quarter, the coach thinks is doing well. So you're, you're going to get hit with that. Um, I, I I don't see it being, being a, a big uh, – I don't see the change coming from inside the building that people are worried about. The, the call won't be coming from inside the house. Is that what I'm hearing there? <laughs> yeah. Well, if, I mean, if you look, if you look at Kyle Shanahan's track record, yes, he doesn't, he doesn't replace his starting quarterback unless his starting quarterback is, is injured. And, and even when injured can defer to the starting quarterback as evidenced by Jimmy Garoppolo. That is an, a, an astute observation there, Jack, and probably one that will be relevant to this scenario this year. Yeah. Cause it, you go through his career and he's never, he's never been a guy who um, has pulled the starting quarterback just to pull him. It, and that, you know, the only time that happened was, you know, with the 49ers, but it wasn't the starting quarterback. That was when he was playing, you know, Nick Mullins was starting, but Mullins was the, the third stringer, so he or second stringer, so he didn't have any kind of, of uh, he didn't have anything invested really in him like he has with the, the starting quarterbacks. Right, didn't have a claim to that starting role as Lance does here. Just wanted to bring in to clarify. Moses Martinez says, "Rob Shu, I'm just messing with Jack. I'm ripping Thomas." Also, that seems to be a common trend for poor Ambry Thomas. <laughs> is everybody? is ripping him at this point in time. So closing out this topic around the, the practice squad depth, is it just me, Jack, or is there a new trend that we're seeing within the NFL? Are you noticing that more players seem to be sticking with their same team after the 53-man cuts since the rule changes and everything that's gone down with the, the changes around COVID protocols? Yeah, absolutely, because now your practice squad at your – I know we talk about the roster being 53, but the roster is really 69. If you're if you're full, you have your 53 man roster and your 16 player, you know, practice squad. So, and the ability to pull those practice squad players up at any time, your roster is really your your entire active roster plus your practice squad. Mm. And uh, John Lynch talked about that yesterday and how how good he thinks that is for the league. And I agree with him. I think it's really good for these teams to be able to have so much depth and really to be able to develop players within their system. And so there's not there's not quite as much of a reason for teams to, to, to for players to leave organizations uh, unless the team just gets rid of them. You know, yeah. Them does this new dynamic allow players to believe that they are now a part of that team's farm system and that it is far more likely? Hey, if, if I stay with the team that I practice with all offseason and any injury occurs, which will happen, this is the frickin NFL these new rules allow me to be flexed in and, and it gives me my shot far better to stay with the team that I've already proven myself. Sure. I'm on the fringe, but I'm the next man up as opposed to going to a new organization and having to start all over again. It just feels to me that again, with a guy like Kamoko Ture, the Niners being able to hold on to someone like that feels like an absolute steal. Absolutely. And, and, and look at the, and, and look at the 40 years practice squad. Malik Turner is a veteran. Dante Johnson's a veteran. Tayshawn Gibson is a veteran. Right. Um, Kamoka Ture, like you said, Akeem Spence, Alex Barrett, Keaton Sutherland, Willie Sneed. Those guys are all veteran players. So the 49ers have an extremely deep roster and they have a deep practice squad. They that again, they only have three three active safeties on their 53 man roster. But I think if you if you were to ask almost anybody, they would tell you that Tayshawn Gibson is really their fourth, you know, safety. He's, yeah. he's most, you know. I, I get the sense that as soon as we get through Chicago, he's going to get promoted so that it's not a guaranteed contract for the entire year, but he's brought aboard to, to be a part of that safety room from week two on. That would make just so much sense to me. And John B., echoing that sentiment right before you did with us as a sneakerhead here on the channel, says, Rob, the practice squad used to be all no names, and now I'm seeing known guys like Willie Sneed on a practice squad. Kind of weird, but I'm here for it. Me too. A guy like Willie Sneed is a – he sticks his nose in there when he's blocking. He's got the kind of mentality, that dog mentality Kyle Shanahan seeks out in his wide receiver room. And now you're able to keep a wily veteran like that around the team – even if he doesn't contribute, which he will from a practice standpoint, potentially from an elevation to the 53-man standpoint, he contributes, those veterans like that, contribute from a team cohesion standpoint. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, very much looking forward to how the team does stay in cohesion. Speaking of potential non-cohesion issues, let's yeah. talk a little bit about Jimmy and Trey, Jack. Let's get into it. Let me just ask you point blank your unfiltered opinion on this one with this move, keeping Jimmy Garoppolo around, having them both on the roster, Brock Purdy as the backup. So you now have three quarterbacks in that quarterback room, substantial uh, experience for your backup. Obviously, is this a net positive for the team? I don't know how it can't be. I think having, you know, this is okay. Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo aren't Joe Montana and Steve Young. They not are not. Close. That is correct. But when when the Farners had those two, they had the best quarterback room in the league, right? And then you yes. go to their, thir their third team guy, which was Steve Bono, and, and all three of those guys at one point were pro bowlers, right? That's wild. By a country mile, they had the best quarterback room. Yeah, and, and, and I think when you put Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance together as your one and two, that is the best one-two punch at that position that you have in the NFL. So to me, it's a, I don't see how – I don't understand the people who are thinking this isn't a net positive. Because it, it's absolutely a net positive. That's what I'm confused by. Is I, I get it. So when I first talked about this, I had to fully acknowledge that I see the stress of this. I see the added complication of keeping Jimmy Garoppolo around. And I very much want to acknowledge that. However, when I calculate that into the equation of coming up with, is this a net positive? Meaning I take all of the positives of, of this decision, all of, of the potential pitfalls and weigh them on my scales here. I find it tilted in a heavily favoring direction for a net positive for San Francisco. When you replace on your depth chart the name Nate Sudfeld with Jimmy freaking Garoppolo, I don't know how anyone can argue that this team got worse from a talent standpoint. And bottom line in the NFL is sure, you got to keep, keep team cohesion together, got to keep your locker room in lockstep, but it's a talent-based league. And the more talented roster you're able to put together, the better chance you have at winning every Sunday, the better chance you have at making it through a grueling 17-game schedule and another three games if you're planning to get to the dance. Adding Jimmy Garoppolo feels like it insulates the 49ers at, again, one of the most critical positions in the game. Yeah, and, and you you know, you know, kind of mentioned – I'm going to ask you the – I'm going to ask you a question here. Is, Please. What is what – is, you know, the, the concern here, I get the concern. I get the concern of the the issues in the locker room, I guess, is what the concern is, right? That is there any, what is the concern here with Jimmy and Trey? What is the concern about having Jimmy Garoppolo? Tell me what you yeah. think that is, and I'll give you my thought on it. Yeah, the, the concern for me is, is what was very palpable last year, right? I, I know what we were told during the season. We were told it wasn't a big deal. We were told that everyone got along within the locker room. We were told that within the quarterback room, everyone understood their roles. And we witnessed when the media asked those continual questions, nothing against the media, obviously, being someone who likes to talk about the Niners and speaking to you, who's there in the media room, but the relentless questions about the situation most clearly got on people's nerves. And that may have been limited to the pressers, but it was very visible. It was visible for the players that were continually asked about it. It was very visible for Coach Shanahan, which makes me surprised that he was willing to subject himself to it again. And then it felt as if, at the end, when everyone involved, save for the front office and, and uh, Coach Shanahan, thought that this thing was over, they started to, to tell the truth. Jimmy Garoppolo saying something like, I wouldn't have wished that situation on my worst enemy. Trey Lance talking about, yeah, it was, you know, it was a little bit weird at times. So it felt like when they thought it was over, they acknowledged the difficulty of it. But now we're back to the, no, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So to me, it is that awkwardness primarily from outside forces yeah i, I guess the, the, i guess the only reason i asked the question is because i i'm just not i'm just not seeing it in that again it kind of goes back to what i said earlier like kyle shanahan has been very straightforward with everything throughout this process going back to 2019 to 2021 right after the trade was made the early on in that process I think it was the day during the draft at one point he was asked something about the situation and he said 
it's going to be really hard for Trey to beat out Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo is a very good quarterback. It's going to be hard for him. He never said that Jimmy is the guy, but he pretty much said that it's going to be very difficult for Trey Lance to beat him out. Right. And then they, they went through the whole thing. And guess what? Jimmy was the starting quarterback. Garoppolo was a starting quarterback week one. He played all the way through. The only time that he did, he did not play was when he was injured in the second half against Seattle the following week because he was injured. And then when he was injured – in week uh, 17 against Houston. I don't, I think that's going to be the same thing we're going to see play out this year. He's, he's on record as saying that Trey Lance is the quarterback. He's said right. this is Trey Lance's team. And this is going to, and, and I think we see the same thing play out that happened last year was, you know, as long as Trey Lance is healthy, he's going to play. I, and the one thing last year that is different is last year when they were at three and five, if they had lost to the Rams to fall to three and six, I think at that point you'd make the switch to Trey and, and, and Cal Shanahan's kind of mentioned that. Right. But they didn't, they won the game and then they just went on a run. And so there was no, there was no reason to make the switch. And I think now with it happening, you go Trey Lance as your starter. There is zero reason for Jimmy to play unless Trey is injured. Really? Or he just completely is bombing, and then you might think about making the, tra- the you know a transition. Right. But even then, I think it's very. It would be very if you're Kyle Shanahan, you can't pull Trey Lance unless you're done with him. Right. And and, and I and I don't and I, I think that Kyle Shanahan is a smart enough coach that he knows that already. I'm yeah. giving I'm giving him a. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that I think a lot of people who are questioning what how this is going to play out aren't. Because I think if you just if you just pay attention to what Kyle Shanahan's done and what Kyle Shanahan has said, he's told you and he's shown you exactly how this is going to play out already. And and that's what gives me solace about this as well. When I include all factors, I come to the very comfortable conclusion that this will absolutely work out, that it is a better move to have greater talent on this roster, even if it does come with a cost to it, even if there is stress, even if that stress is only for me personally, Jack, even if I'm the only one feeling that I'm taking it into the equation, but it's yeah. not enough to offset that net positive. Again, I, I think that is very clear in my book. Want to bring in these couple of super chats coming in. Harold Murillo coming in to say some fans perceive Jimmy Garoppolo as a threat, but he's not. Jimmy Garoppolo is a team player and wants to be a 49er. Nothing wrong with that. 49ers culture, the best. I'll tell you, Jack, I was warmed by kind of, just seeing Jimmy again, just seeing him in the in the uh, the freaking Niners uniform, hearing him talk to the faithful, seeing that sheepish grin on his face as he's clearly choking down that idea that he's just said goodbye to these same reporters, and now he's back in front of them saying hello. <laughs> and then the clip of him walking out to the practice field where he talks to the camera, missed you, faithful. Like ah, it's just it's good to be back. I don't. I don't understand the level of animosity towards Jimmy Garoppolo. I, I get where it comes from. The the, uh, the statement Al Michaels made was so apropos when talking about, uh, you know, you are, uh, God, it, you're most critical of those you're, you're familiar with. I forget the way in which he said it, which is so picturesque, a very common <laughs> saying. Familiarity um, but, breeds contempt. Yes, familiarity breeds contempt. And so true. We are so familiar with Jimmy Garoppolo's mistakes, and they are oftentimes very similar that we believe him to be worse than he is. We, we as the 49er faithful, really blow that out of proportion. I'm just – I'm thrilled to see him back there. I'm thrilled to see how it works out because I do believe, like you, it's a net positive. Yeah, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's a net positive. I I'm going to say, I was going to, I'm glad you, you you know, got back to me here, but I, I, I'm a little nervous about this situation because there's way too much that I'm saying, or that I've said this week that I hear coming from, from John Lynch, <laughs> you know, like in this, this, <laughs> this morning, this morning on KMBR, he's talking about, uh, what, you know, uh, what was it? Oh, it was, you know, as the process played out. That, you know, they were going to, they were going to, you know, nothing was happening. And and he was having a discussion with Kyle Shanahan. He told Kyle, he's like, there's another way that this might be able to play out. And he's like, what? He says, maybe Jim, we keep Jimmy. And he's, and Kyle says to him, there's no way he's going to, he's going to stay here, you know? And, yeah. and that's what played out. And that's how I felt throughout this. And I told you, I think I might've mentioned this earlier in the week. I know I've said it on my show is that I didn't think that Jimmy Garoppolo would go for, and it, I just didn't think he was going to take it 
and, and eat it and stay here no. uh, with the 49ers. And the fact that he did, you know, he's so crazy. Swallowed his pride in doing so and said as much in that presser. I loved it. He, yes. it, I think it was an answer to Jennifer, Jennifer Lee Chan asking about, you know, was it an ego blow to come back here? A team that you started for in the Super Bowl, in the NFC Championship game, to come back and hold a clipboard. And he says something along the lines of, hey, if, if, uh, if that hurts your ego, then maybe you need to put your ego in check a little bit. And that, to me, is the epitome of, of a team player and what you want to hear from a guy that is going to be content holding the clipboard, that is going to do what is asked of him. Jaguayo56 coming in with the super chat here as well. Rob and Jack, the reason it won't be a problem is that every player in that team respects Jimmy G for how he handled this situation, in my opinion. I share that opinion with you, Jaguayo56. I do believe that this locker room respects the hell out of Jimmy Garoppolo for what he has done with this organization, for being there with him in that band of brothers. It feels evident to me in how everyone speaks about him, including the all-important player of Trey Lance and the way that he speak, speaks about Jimmy Garoppolo. Is that the same sense that you get being even closer to the locker room, Jack? How many times yesterday, I think it could have been almost become a drinking game with that press conference with uh, with Trey Lance yesterday. How many times he said he was super excited. Every time he said super excited, take a drink. I think he would have been under the table <laughs> by the time Trey Lance got done with his seven and a half minute you know, session at the podium. Because that's that's what was happening. He was, you know, it was constant, super happy, super excited. He said it a number of times. Super and, excited. Uh, real quick, and then also since you asked me about it, I think I think that Trey Lance nailed it when with his response when he when he was asked if there's more pressure, and he's like, I don't know. He's like, I'm more worried about what the guys in the locker room think, what I think, what the coaches think, and what the people in the organization think. Outside of that, uh, it's you know we're fine. We're gonna work this work through this thing, and again. Steve Young said pretty much the same thing uh, back on the 20th of, seven, of July on the radio uh, on 95.7 The Game. It was almost exactly that. And you know that those two guys have talked because right. it's been in the media. I think that they, that was the answer that he gave yesterday. That, that was the whether it's totally how he feels about it. He's saying the right things. And more you say the right things, a lot of times it just becomes what you think anyway. Amen to that. Amen to that. Fake it till you make it, right? All right. Uh, JT Dodon is coming in. Th this one came up before, Jack. So on one of the previous programs, I don't recall if it was the last one on this channel last Friday or whether it was in, when you and I were on your channel Monday. And it came out, I, I thought it was just a, a slip of the tongue, but someone else caught it and, and asked me about it. I think it was during the mailbag, wherein we were talking about Jimmy and we were talking about Trey. And mm -hmm. it, it was a statement around something like, you know, neither Jimmy or Trey are Hall of Fame quarterbacks. And I just assumed what you were implying by that is neither one are right now. I could infer that I think in Jimmy's career, he's probably not going to get to that point. But with Trey, mm -hmm. way too early to tell here. But that did someone heard that and keyed into it being a more predictive statement around Trey Lance. So JT Dodon comes in with this one chance to give your actual opinion on it as opposed to me trying to explain it over that show. It says, Rob Shue, can you ask Jack, does he believe Trey has the intangibles to be a Hall of Fame quarterback one day? And if he thinks he will, and why or why not? Just curious, love what you do, Rob. Appreciate that, JT to Don. Do you think that you've seen some of the intangibles that, that could propel Trey into being a Hall of Fame quarterback? Hmm. No, I, and I've, I've gotten a lot of questions on this on my channel too. And I'll say this, it's extremely difficult to be in the Hall of Fame. It's a very yes, it small is. group. And yep. a guy like Eli Manning has two Super Bowl trophies. And most people don't think he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Great point. I don't I, I would I would probably agree with that too. I just don't I don't see the skill set from Trey Lance at this point in his career that would translate to a guy who's going to show up in the Hall of Fame someday. He he not that doesn't mean that he's not going to have a good career. Right. I just don't believe he's going to be a guy that eventually is going to land in Canton. Now, I could be completely wrong. You, you know, maybe 10, 15 years down the road, you get, we'll, we'll find out and you guys can tell me that I was wrong. But I just don't see the quarterbacks that make the Hall of Fame are usually pretty accurate. And I don't see that from Trey Lance right now. Trey Lance yesterday in a fourth row stretch during individual period throwing to the ball boys where all he was doing was play, play faking, rolling to his right and throwing the ball. Three of his four passes went over the head of who he was throwing the ball to, and it was, and they weren't particularly close. And this is an NFL quarterback. This isn't this isn't you know uh, 
Johnny from, you know, uh, you know, tech high school. This is an right. NFL quarterback that that's that's doing that. And we've seen already in the preseason games that this these inaccurate throws translate from practice into games. We saw it with the you know the out route to um to Danny Gray in, in against Green Bay. We saw the inaccuracy on the throw to George Kittle um against Houston. We saw the inaccuracy on the throw to Malik Turner. It was a completion, but it was still an, an inaccurate throw. And couldn't can he improve on that? Sure. He's in year two in the 49er system and accuracy is still an issue and it's not going to get better now because right now the pedal is to the metal and you really don't have time to be working on that stuff all that much. And it's there's just so much else that goes into it. And you know, um I think that he he's got the ability to be successful. But when we're talking about a Hall of Fame guy, which is, you know, 0.1% of players make it in the NFL, and then right. probably another 0.1% of players in the, who are in the NFL make it to the Hall of Fame. And I just don't see the intangibles from Trey Lance at this point to from like an accuracy. Like he's a smart guy. He's a very athletic guy. I yeah. take nothing away from Trey Lance. I think he's, you know, there, there's a lot of really good qualities. I just don't know if he's going to ascend to be a guy who one day reaches the hall of fame. You're going to have to win sure. a couple of super bowls at least in order to do that. And we'll see what happens. That's very fair. And I, you know, I see people that, that hear what you're saying here, Jack, and, and, and interpret that to be that you're somehow against Trey Lance. And that's not what I hear here. I, I hear honest observation of what you have seen to this point, a, a firm understanding of what you believe to be the, the critical skills to be successful at this position and an admission that uh, things can change, that this team could carry him to a Super Bowl early on in his career. That could change the trajectory of the way he is perceived within this league. But that your observation is there are some skill sets that need to be improved. And if those leaps are not made, it would be very challenging for him to be a Hall of Fame quarterback. I see that as as more of an honest assessment and less of a a condemnation of Trey Lance. And what I know of you, Jack, is you will continue to take in new observation of Trey Lance. You will continue to watch. And if things change, if those skill sets do improve, I would imagine that will lead you to change your opinion on the outcome because that's the logical way to approach things is, is taking in that new information and reassessing from there. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm not, it's, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to, to rip on them in any way. I'm telling you what I'm seeing. Yeah. And that's and, what I'm and hearing. That, and, and that's really all it is. And, and it doesn't mean that he, the 49ers are going to lose, you know, that he's going to be awful. doesn't mean any of those things, but you're asking me if he's going to be one of the best players ever to play the position in the league. And as a second year player right now, I, I'm not going to project him to there. And I know people don't like, and I think the thing is with me is, is I, I was watching practice yesterday and filming it. And as I was filming it, I was like, wow, okay, so he missed that one, no big deal. And then he missed the next two. And I didn't realize until I went back after practice that those were all in a row because the other quarterbacks are rolling in there too. And I was like, wow, he missed three out of four of those, bang, bang. And, and one of them, you know, he overthrows it. And so he cuts back in the line to get a second rep and then and he hits it and then he starts to throw it deeper and he misses them and he cuts back in the line and hit it again and he misses it again. And then, you know, but it's whatever. Where He's going to be, the, the guy, the kid is going to be okay. And yes, could if, be very special with this team, right? It doesn't not, take individual glory to win Super Bowls necessarily if you build the right roster. No, and and, and Trey Lance can be fine. It's I think he's going to be okay. I just I'm, I'm I'm positive on him, but I'm also going to show you. I'm telling you the negative aspect of it. You want to know the positives? The positive is the kid's fast. The kid has the ability to move around in the pocket. And he's going to save some negative plays with his legs. We saw him do it in, in Houston, right? The the bad throw when he's rolling out to his right, that's a bad throw. But at the same time, it was better than a sack. And right. so he's minimizing the damage of that one. Now, if he'd thrown that ball and instead of it hitting the ground, it had, he threw it high and a safety picks it off, well, then we have a different discussion. But you can say that a play was bad and not be hating on him and, and, and understand that it's not a, a good throw. And I, I've seen too many people – trying to make his bad plays not a big deal and i, right. I don't i don't excuse understand. them away i don't understand yeah i don't understand the the desire to excuse away negative plays 
whether it's Jimmy Garoppolo or Trey Lance or Tom Brady or any quarterback, I, I just don't, I don't understand the, the reason behind that other than that you're a fan of the player. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. And I love what Jaguar 56 is saying here. Sneakerhead here on the channel comes in to say, Rob, I love Jack's honest opinions. He loves the 49ers and that I know to be true. Talking about those memories you and I go back and talk about from the 80s and all the games that we have attended that, yes, you are giving us your unfiltered, unbiased opinion as well. But underneath that is a strong layer of love for the 49ers organization. No doubt about that in my mind. CT Law coming in with the uh, super chat. The reality is no matter who likes Trey or not, his whole career is on the line. If Kyle has to yank him one time is bad, but multiple times the kid's career is over. How bad does it look for him? I, you know, I think that you may be right on this one, Jack, in saying that even pulling him once for a performance-based issue could be enough to – spiral that career or to send the signal that it's not going to work out here. I don't foresee that being the case. I am optimistic about Kyle Shanahan's ability to scheme with Trey Lance here. And I'll have a, a question for you around that. Uh, but I agree with that sentiment that it really doesn't matter whether we like Trey Lance or not. He is going to prove what he can do out there on the field. And to your point of quality quarterbacks don't always make it to the, the hall of fame. I mean, Philip Rivers, Eli Manning, right? There are guys who put up, amazing statistical career performances, but it, it has to be the right combination of what you contribute, what the team contributes, and what are the end results. Trey could make it if this team climbs into three or four Super Bowls over six years, regardless of what he does on the field, or he could be really solid like a Phillip Rivers or Eli Manning and not get maybe the credit that he might deserve. Absolutely. I mean, if he's if he's a, if he has a Philip Rivers or an Eli Manning career, I don't think there's anybody that's a Furniers fan that would be upset about that. No complaints. No complaints. If he gets us one Lombardi trophy, that will be well worth it to me. Do you know how long we have been trying for that sixth <laughs> one? All right. Uh, let's see. John B had a question he wanted me to ask there. I believe it's in reference to another quarterback. I saw it there and I was going to get to it. Ooh, I cannot. Here we go. Honest question. Does Jack see Josh Allen? This is the last one we're going to do on the Hall of Fame. Then we're on to the rest of the category. Does Jack see Josh Allen as a potential Hall of Fame quarterback? Because his path is very similar to the NFL, to Trey, and he was not accurate in his first couple of years. And now he's a superstar. So with a trajectory of, of a Josh Allen, do you think he's headed in the correct direction towards HOF? Again, he's got to win some Super Bowls, and I, I, you know, Josh Allen is a is a very good player. He's exciting. His he's on a, a good uh, a good path, uh, but he's going to have to do more than what we've seen from him. Right right now, he's he's on the right trajectory to eventually maybe get there, but he still has a long way to go to become somebody that you would think is, of as a Hall of Fame quarterback. I mean, you got to really go back and think of the guys who are in the Hall of Fame and what they did, other than you know. The guys that played from the 80s and beyond, guys like Bob Greasy, you can look at their numbers and you can, they're laughable. But right. when you talk about like Joe Montana, look what Joe Montana, look at what Steve Young did. Steve Young was a multi, won a Super Bowl, was a multi-time MVP, put up numbers that had never been seen before in the NFL. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Now, is Trey Lance going to be in the Hall of Fame? He might be, but right now, we'll see. Let's see. He'll be back at the end of this year and, and let's see where he is. I mean, you know, I it's it's way too early, and I know that I said that I don't think it's because I I it's again Hall of Fame. Let's just be an MVP before we want to talk about it. <laughs> let's Hall of Fame. take it step by step, huh, Jack? All right, yeah. so here look, we're taking a, a step back here, and we're talking about again going back to Jimmy and Trey. This dynamic. This is a, a quick hitter question here for you, and it's about the faithful themselves. And, and based on what we're seeing in the chat here, I get my own sense of the answer to this question. Will the fan base be able to help themselves in calling for Jimmy G at the slightest hint of adversity? Or are we headed into a season where we just have these diametrically opposed forces within the fan base and they're going to be yelling no matter what's going on? It's going to be the same as last year. It's just going to be reversed. The, the guys yeah. that were, were screaming for Trey to play last year are going to be happy, and, and they're going to be defending Trey. And the guys who are, who were you know happy about Trey uh, Jimmy starting last year are going to be you know ripping on Trey and wanting Jimmy to play. It's all the same thing. Just take them and flip them around. 
Amen to that. Ellis 10, sneakerhead here on the channel, coming in with Jimmy G stats. Jimmy G 10, 3,810 yards, 20 touchdowns, 12 picks. What will Trey have? I've made a prediction before. Off the cuff, I'm not, I'm not uh, able to call it to mind, and I wouldn't want to contradict that. Uh, but I see him having a, a positive season here. Uh, Jack, have you made any uh, predictions about what you think his stat line might be? No need to, to call it out here if you haven't, but if you have one in mind. Well, just if 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 Trey Lance does nothing better than what he did last year, let's say mm-hmm. he plays exactly like he played last year with the same completion percentage and, and, the, and nothing else changes, like the same, same yards per attempt and all of that. Yes. His numbers will end up almost exactly to what Jimmy Garoppolo's are. He'll have that around that many yards, but his percentage, his touch, his completion percentage will be lower because his net yards per pass attempt was higher than Jimmy Garoppolo last year. Right. His net, and so what, okay, net yards per pass attempt is your passing yards minus your sack yards, and that gives you the number. So I believe that he will be right around the same output as Jimmy Garoppolo if he can play just at the level he played last year. If he plays any better, those numbers are going to be better than Jimmy Garoppolo. And that was my prediction. That's been my predict. That was the prediction I put out. Go to the press Democrat. You'll see it. It's in there. The press Democrat. Speaking of which, uh, if, if you're still watching this video, smash that like button for us, amplify that signal. And all of Jack's information is down below in the description of the video. We're going to talk a little bit about Chicago over the next five minutes, but all of that is down below. You can follow him on Twitter, subscribe on YouTube. Jack just hit a monumental milestone as far as views on his channel. Over 300,000, right, Jack? That is freaking phenomenal. Uh, Congratulations on that. And the Press Democrat link is down there as well. So go ahead and bookmark that on your favorite browser. I do want to bring in, Jack, speaking of this dynamic of of the backup and whatnot, Armchair QB1 has a suggestion. He says, I think Rob should back up Jack on his channel. And Jack should back up Rob. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, I, I see this dynamic. You and I are cool, calm enough to make that work, just like Jimmy and Trey. We have the personality types that it takes to keep the locker room together, Jack. Absolutely. That's why That's why I start on Monday and you start on Friday. Amen to that. All right, so two quick questions, then we're on to talking about Chicago as we close out. Is Jimmy here all year? And the way too early prediction, does Jimmy start any games this year aside from injury-related ones? Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo will be with the foreigners all year unless a a quarterback is injured on a, and it's on a team that's contending. Playoff that caliber. Team. I like yes. that answer. I'm in and, agreement. And... Uh, the second question, does Jimmy Garoppolo start any games if, if Trey Lance is not injured? The answer to that is no. Boom. There it is. Uh, I also have to answer the hard-hitting questions. Craftwork doing the good deed. Am I wearing matching socks? I am at the moment. For those that need to know. Let's get to that last topic, talking about Chicago. Jack, does your gut tell you that you're going to... <laughs> Does your gut tell you that the 49ers will have an aggressive or conservative game called for Trey Lance week one at Chi-Town? Ah, uh, shoot. I, I have no idea, man. We, you and I talked about this before the first preseason game. And I said, oh, it's probably going to be relatively vanilla, not a whole lot. And then, you know, boom, touchdown, deep shot down the left sideline, touchdown. <laughs> um, I, I think it's going to be a, a situation. There's going to, you know, it's going to be a typical 49ers game plan. And there's going to be some shot plays that are going to be built into it. And it's just, it's, it's again. I don't think the 49ers offense is going to be drastically different than it was before. I think it's going to be very similar. Uh, a lot of the s- same stuff, maybe a little bit more of the, the zone read, uh, but they did that a little bit with Jimmy Garoppolo last year. And you know, every, everything that I've seen them work on in practice this year, they've worked on before the, the zone read triple option stuff. They've just worked on it at a higher rate this year. Yes, yes, they can. I'm fascinated by the fact that Fable JVC is now requesting to see the Sox. That feels a little bit odd, if I'm being honest. No, I'm kidding, JVC, kidding. All right, so next question here. You know, I I suspect I know the answer to this, but do you expect to see that the same inconsistency from the offseason for Trey Lance carry through, or is Shanahan going to be able to to minimize it or even completely eliminate it through his gameplay and, and specific play calling to highlight Trey's uh, firmer assets? That's a tough one, really. You know, that we were, when we were talking earlier about, about Lance, Swansong was in the comment section saying, you know, to, to not rip Lance because of, 
you know, talk about Lance and the games versus what we're seeing in practice. And if you watch the game against Houston, don't take my word for it. If you think that I'm negative on him and I, it's, I'm trying to whatever, right. Pull up Twitter and go to rich Madrid's Twitter. He showed about five or six plays yesterday or the day before in which they're negative plays that are attributable to the quarterback. Mm. And that's about as far as I'm going to say, because I don't, I don't know. And the only way that I think Kyle Shanahan can just dial up things that are easy for Trey or for him to do like the little play action dump off stuff, which is, it's just minimal. You know, he's got to be able to drop back and he's got to be able to make those throws. Right. And so if he can't do that, I don't know if there's anything that Kyle Shanahan can else, you know, I don't know how he makes the, the life easier because he can't go out there and throw the ball for him. Yeah. Yep. It, it makes sense. Some of those throws that he needs to be able to hit are core throws within this offense. It, it feels near impossible to scheme around an inability to uh, be efficient there, that we, we will need to see those struggles as he becomes more proficient in making those throws. Th- these last two couple questions are tied to the same idea, and that is the 49ers brought in a couple of players for workouts today, three players specifically, uh, two tackles, one Leroy Watson out of UTSA, uh, waived by the Falcons. He's a conferred, uh, converted tight end. He was a third-team offensive lineman with Atlanta, was waived. Another tackle, uh, Gene DeLance, previously with the Bears, undrafted out of Florida, played right tackle. Uh, that line there at Florida was pretty good, ranked second in the uh, SEC. And then a linebacker in Buddy Johnson, previously with the Steelers, uh, 2021 fourth-round pick, was in four games last year. And you know you got to trust Pittsburgh with their wide receiver and linebacker selections. Uh, so maybe that's someone to keep an eye on. But we had those workouts, obviously. Shanahan himself hinted at a, being a long time before Chicago with regard specifically to the offensive line. Do you think that we're likely to see any changes to the roster before week one? I can see them maybe adding somebody there that's, you know, depending on where Mike McGlinchey is, they might be looking for a right tackle that can can fit in there because it seems like Hans was brought in to play center based off of something that uh, John Lynch kind of said yesterday without right. being asked about it. So I could see them going out because if McGlinchey's not healthy behind the kivets, they don't really have anything to tackle. Well, Jack, I am thrilled with today's episode. Love the interaction we had in the chat today. It was off the chain. Appreciate everyone. If you're still watching at this point, please do hit that like button on your way out. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit those notifications so that you see when we go live on the channel and do all of the same with Jack Hammer. Again, the links for Jack are down below in the description of the video, including that all-important link to the Press Democrat where Jack writes those stories. Jack, as always, fantastic time today. Really looking forward to next week where we will be talking about Chicago and then seeing you in Chi-Town, my friend. Looking forward to it. Can't wait. All right, everybody, enjoy your long weekend. Hold the phones. Charles Thurman doing the good deed. Charles Thurman comes in with a super chat saying won't matter which quarterback we have until we get a better O line. We shall see if the Niners add to that. And perhaps even without that, they will be able to scheme around it for week one against Chicago. Raphael five, six, two Niners sneakerhead here on the channel as well. Coming in to say great show, Rob and Jack. We really appreciate that. Uh, Thank you so much. I'll be back with uh, Jack on his channel on Monday and enjoy oh it is a long weekend maybe we won't be on monday jack and i will have to talk about that enjoy your long weekend faithful and until the next time cheers